Good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Gromkowski. I'm one of the assistant directors here at William Patterson University in the Graduate Admissions Office. First and foremost, I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedule this evening to join us for our webinar. Um, we're excited to have you here. This is a, a fairly new offering for us to be able to have uh, online events that allow you to take in information about some of our programs from the comfort of your couch at work, wherever we may you may find yourself. Certainly, it's our hope that this is a convenient way to learn more uh, about our music program. Um, we have here uh, to speak further about it, uh, Dr. David Dempsey, who's gonna be talking about our music program and also some information specifically uh, about our uh, jazz program in general. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to him in just uh, a moment. I wanna make you aware of uh, one thing real quick, right under the handouts tab that's there on the GoToWebinar screen, you'll see that this PowerPoint presentation is available for you now uh, in its entirety. If at any point during the presentation or at the end of the presentation you wanna download it, um, there's a number of uh, bits of information about uh, website links, uh, contact information, um, different elements of the application process. So certainly uh, it might be helpful at some point if you wanna download it quick so that you have it. And if anybody joins us late, it affords you the opportunity to go back and to catch up on some slides that you might have missed. Um, so do keep that in mind too, again, right under the handout tab. Um, so again, thank you uh, so much for joining us uh, this evening. And with that being said, I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Dr. David Dempsey. So thank you very much. This is David Dempsey. I'm the coordinator of jazz studies here at William Patterson. And uh, in that role, I was actually one of the designers of this program. So I'm here to tell you about our master's degree program that is in two tracks, the performance track and the composition arranging track. And as Brian said, as I'm doing that, I'm going to show you uh, some photos of the program in action, as it were, and also some information. Some of those information slides have a lot of information on them with uh, links and YouTube links and everything, but don't panic. As Brian said, you can just download that so that you can uh, just cut and paste those links at any time. For a lot of students who attend here, this jazz program is really the perfect combination. That is, it is a New York City program. We're 18 miles from New York City. As I sit here on our campus uh, in Wayne, New Jersey, I can actually see the New York skyline. Uh, we're about a 40 minute uh, car ride away unless you go in at rush hour, which doubles that, but uh, musicians never would be normally. Uh, so we have all the intensity and faculty of a high level New York City jazz program. We have uh, the students here represent uh, 22 U.S. states and six foreign countries. We have three Fulbright scholars in the program right now in the jazz program. Uh, but on the other hand, along with that New York intensity, uh, we have actually a campus environment. This is a photo of the campus that was actually taken a week ago today. And uh, uh, the arts building is uh, going to be sort of over on the left. You can see uh, over by the water tower in the, in the right of this picture is the graduate dorm. If you want to live on campus, you can do that, but there are also numerous housing opportunities around the campus. It's a suburban environment, despite the fact that this is William Patterson University. That's the gentleman, William Patterson, not the city of Patterson. Patterson City is near us, so there's a real urban environment, but also, as you can see, this is a 400-acre nature preserve. It's got really an amazing combination of that level of uh, jazz faculty, jazz intensity, musical opportunities, and a, a wooded 400-acre campus, so it's a, a great situation. One of the uh, huge points I want to make, and I'll get into this more uh, in uh, as we get into this presentation, is that we also are one of the few schools that offer full tuition ride grad assistantships. So you can put a, a black line under that in your notes, full ride grad assistantships. In the end, about 80% of our students end up getting GAs. So uh, we only control two of those GAs in the music department, but a number of our students end up working around the campus in other offices, other departments. Uh, students come here for 
really two main reasons. Number of students coming here to gain a foothold in the New York City jazz community, which um, you can we can say what we want. Of course, New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz, but uh, modern jazz was born in New York, and New York City is still uh, the center of the planet of modern jazz, and uh, it's still the only city in the country where I'm a saxophonist, and I can go into a music store and. Uh, I'm going there to buy reeds, and I turn around, and Joe Lovano or Chris Potter is there because they got to buy reeds too. So it's it's really uh, the New York City jazz community is in a way a very small and closely knit village within this huge New York City environment. So what a lot of musicians want to do is come and be a part of that community. Another. Part of the students come, of course, also for the New York City jazz environment, but also also to specifically prepare for a teaching career, usually college teaching. Uh, and I'll get into those uh, different areas. The uh, master's degree has uh, varying options that will accommodate people who are here for either or both of those reasons. Some of our performance alumni, uh, saxophonist Eric Alexander and Bill Evans, who played with uh, Miles Band, drummers Carl Allen, Bill Stewart, Mark Juliana, and the uh, younger drummer Tyshawn Sori, who's a huge hit nowadays. Uh, right now we have two finalists, semi-finalists in the Monk, the current Monk vocal competition, including one of our Fulbright graduates that just got his degree last May. Um, a number of our folks in the academic realm have gone on to full rides uh, as doctoral students at Manhattan School, Miami, uh, Eastman School of Music. We have master's grads that are now full-time teaching at over a dozen different schools in the U.S. and in several foreign countries. Uh, just a two-sentence history of this program, we are one of the five oldest or longest running programs in the nation. Thad Jones, the great arranger and uh, trumpeter and band leader, was our original director of jazz studies. This program is run in a way by, it's co-led by myself in the coordinatorship of the program and the director of jazz studies, which as you'll see when I name these five people, have been a, a who's who of uh, world-class musicians. As I said, Thad Jones started the program. When Thad moved to Denmark, here you see a picture of Thad um, in uh, one of our classrooms that's still online today. I will have a big band rehearsal myself in this space tomorrow morning. This was in the mid-70s, you can see from the plaid pants era. And uh, uh, after Thad went to Denmark, Rufus Reed uh, directed the program for 20 years. Then uh, three great historic pianists have led the program. The great James Williams, who was a musical director with Art Blakey for a number of years. He was succeeded by Mulgrew Miller. Uh, Mulgrew, who also was with Art Blakey. Woody Shaw had a huge uh, career. As many of you may know, he passed away suddenly of a stroke in 2013. And uh, now, just this fall, uh, the great Bill Sharlap is here. And uh, he's available and in teaching every week. And the director's role is that he conducts six of the 24 small groups. The core of the program is 24 small groups. And as I just said, we also have the jazz orchestra, the 18-piece jazz orchestra. We have a Latin jazz ensemble, and we have a vocal jazz workshop as well. But really the core, it's a small group program at its, at its center. Uh, the structure of the programs, first we'll talk about the performance curriculum. An important element of this, even though it should go without saying, but an important element of this is that there are private in one-on-one -on -one instrument voice lessons every week, all semester. Uh, if you're checking into other programs, especially some of the urban programs, uh, you might want to ask this question because in some cases uh, that will remain nameless, there is a little bit of smoke and mirrors going on where it appears as though you can study with some gigantic name, but if you uh, consult their touring schedule, you realize that they're out of town for all but three weeks in the semester. So we pride ourselves on the fact that you're going to get a private lesson 
every week, all semester. Uh, as I said, the 24 uh, small groups that are each directed by one of our adjunct faculty who are all uh, major New York jazz names, I'll get to them in a minute. Uh, the ensembles meet twice per week every semester, once with the director and once independently. Grad students are uh, in one ensemble per semester, but many of them elect to be in two or more. That's easily possible. Uh, all of these ensembles are, and the courses, are really oriented towards becoming a 21st century performer. In other words, developing a super solid foundation, high skill level, but also aware of the context of all that in building your career. And as such, you'll see their courses in transcription and analysis, topics in jazz history, advanced ear training with Armand Dinellian, performance practice with the director of the program, Bill Charlap teaches that course. That's centered on uh, uh, building a career how to learn tunes, how to practice, how to develop management, how to develop a website and a, a self-image and a brand, as it were. The entrepreneurship continues that. That uh, course works across uh, the department with some of our music management faculty. Also courses in research techniques and jazz pedagogy, which is the art and skill set needed to teach jazz at the college or high school level. And as I said earlier, there are two options. You can either do a thesis or a non-thesis tribute recital, which involves a paper and uh, sort of a, a narrated recital on the music of a certain artist or repertoire. But some people come to our program specifically to write a thesis because they want to go on and get a doctorate. So that option is there as well. Uh, each of these uh, ensembles as I said, is directed by one of our faculty. We also have major guests from time to time. This is, uh, was taken last spring. Uh, the great bassist Christian McBride spent a number of weeks with us last spring. Uh, we have had uh, a long list of guest lecturers and guest performers. Uh, the big band has a guest every semester. I'll get a little more into that when we talk about the arranging program. But uh, that is, you know, we take full advantage of the fact that we are 18 miles from New York City. So a lot of people who would be, you know, the high moment in the semester for a lot of other schools in other parts of the country are here every week because they can teach, they can be a guest, and they can still be home for dinner. Because a lot of quote unquote New York jazz musicians actually live in New, right in New York City in Manhattan, which as I said is 40 minutes away, or they live in North Jersey, which is right around the corner, right in this, in this area of the campus. So we are readily available to that New York City jazz community of musicians and try to maintain our uh, presence in that community constantly. The arranging curriculum has private arranging lessons weekly every semester as well. Uh, our three arranging teachers are Pete McGinnis, who is a wonderful trombonist, leads his own big band in New York City, also a singer, came in third in the month vocal competition the last time it was held, a real triple threat. And then we have uh, two adjunct arrangers, uh, Cecil Bridgewater, who was uh, in Thad Jones Mel Lewis band for many years, also with Art Flakey and the Jazz Messengers, also uh, uh, Horace Silver and uh, has a long history. And the third arranger is uh, the uh, world-renowned Jim McNeely. So between the three of those folks, you're surrounded, you know, stylistically. You have all sorts of different options, and usually our students study with at least two of those, if not three, at all three during their two years here. Uh, again, each of the arrangers is required to be in one ensemble, but many of the arrangers uh, do get involved in the performance area. We can talk more about that later if you have questions about it. Uh, many of the same uh, situations as far as courses, transcription and analysis, topics and arranging with Pete McGinnis, also composing for the media. That's a very important course, film scoring, video game writing, TV, uh, etc. So that's a very useful course. Um, you will also want to know as an arranger that one of the capstone events is that the second year arrangers are asked to write 
contribute an arrangement for our guest artists. For example, this spring, we'll have Randy Brecker here for two weeks, the great trumpeter, and uh, all of our uh, second year final semester arrangers will write a tune for Randy and the big band that will be premiered either on our Jazz Room concert series or at Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola. A word about the faculty. Uh, as I said, we do everything we can to really make our program reality-based, you know? It's really about the reality of building and maintaining a career in jazz. And as such, our faculty are doing what you want to do. Here we see Bill Charlap a couple weeks ago. We had Bill's trio with uh, Kenny Washington and Peter Washington here to do a concert, not for the public, but just for the students. So the members of the trio played and then met with the students on each instrument, and uh, it was a wonderful hang with everybody. Always uh, very important to have the faculty accessible to the students. Not only accessible, but I feel as though the philosophy here, uh, despite the fact that the faculty are all uh, world-renowned people, it's, it's not that, you know, we are the faculty and you are the lowly students and you all kind of kneel at our feet. It's the opposite of that. It's that we're all professional musicians together and that uh, uh, the way I put it to the students, um, I've already made some of the mistakes that I can help you now avoid. I can teach you how to learn tunes, how to speed up your learning curve as a musician and as an instrumentalist, as a vocalist. Uh, at the core, even though, as you saw, we have a very well-organized graduate curriculum, at the core, this is a mentorship situation. A large graduate class would be 10. And of course, all the groups are quartets, quintets, sextets. So usually in this environment, it's like this picture or this one with Harold Mayburn meeting with some of our students, one of our other piano faculty, played with Miles Davis. I mean, he's had a long uh, career in this business. You know, it's four or five students with one of our faculty uh, learning, playing together. As I said, mentorship is uh, the key. Performance opportunities, on this campus, we have performance opportunities both on and off campus. On campus, we have the Jazz Room series, which is the longest running campus-based jazz concert series in the nation, as far as any of us know. Uh, again, we take full advantage of the fact that our campus is only 18 miles from New York City. It's a Sunday afternoon series. and. Uh, most jazz musicians are free at 4 p.m. Sunday afternoon, so we're able to really get the world of jazz here on our campus on those concerts. Um, not only do you get a free ticket for each one of those concerts, it's a public uh, grant-funded public admission event. You get in for free, but also, as you see, um, our student ensembles, one of these 24 ensembles, opens every week. So you get a chance to share the stage, share the sound check, uh, share the backstage, and have a great hang with some of these artists who are here. A great example of the breadth of the jazz room would be uh, the, the net, we're in the midst of that series right now. That series will end with the great alto player Charles McPherson. Uh, the week before that, we have uh, the legendary bassist Richard Davis, who played, as you may well know, with John Coltrane, some of the later ensembles, uh, was also uh, the first bassist with Thad Jones' Mel Lewis Orchestra. He will be making a CD at that concert. It's a CD live recording session, and that concert will be totally free improvisation. He's told the other guys in the band and women that there's no rehearsal, there's no conversation. So that's going to be a very exciting day because it's free jazz playing, but for keeps on a CD. So that's going to be a uh, very interesting day. Uh, the concert before that will be this coming Sunday. We have Jerry Dodgen, the legendary New York alto saxophonist who was also in that original Thad Jones Mel Lewis band. As I said, Thad was our uh, founding director, so we are about to help celebrate 
50 years of that band. February 7th, 2016 is their 50th anniversary. So we'll be playing some of Jerry's music, some of Thad Jones' music that feature Jerry. Jerry's conducting the band and is performing, so it's another chance, again, for our students to rub elbows and be present with, uh, you know, jazz reality. Speaking of jazz reality, here's Roy Haynes and his group. If you've ever been around Roy, you know that he is an extraordinary person. Uh, for those looking on who may not be jazz musicians, looking at Roy, uh, this picture was taken a couple of years ago. He was a younger man then of 87. He's an amazingly uh, strong and uh, vibrant guy, lugs his own drums, hung out with the students backstage. It was a, an amazing day whenever he's around. So again, just the privilege of being part of this New York City jazz community as as part of the uh, you know the the master's program here off campus there are uh, a number of different uh, situations sometimes we do off campus gigs with our groups as such in other words this is a, a photo last spring at Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola Jazz at Lincoln Center with our two our jazz orchestra students performing with uh, our two saxophone professors on the left, Rich Perry, and on the right, Vincent Heron, both world-class players, but uh, interesting to note that they had never played together before. So one of our grad arrangers created a piece that featured the two of them together. So uh, that was a great moment captured in this photo. Uh, there are also, because of the population base, there's a number of great little clubs in New Jersey, and uh, we encourage our students to become part of that New York jazz community to start promoting themselves to really put their stuff out there as soon as they arrive. You know, in order to really break into this community, it takes the better part of a decade. Well, the two years in this master's degree should be the first two years of that decade you know, create a demo tape, create, make sure you have a good photo, create a bio for yourself, we'll help you do all this. Create your website, get your name out there, start going into the city and in Jersey to the jam sessions, really get your name out there. And for a number of our grad students, you know, you know their names. I listed some of them, Eric Alexander, Carl Allen. They started playing major gigs while they were still in the program. Bill Evans, the saxophonist, got called in the graduate dorm by Miles Davis. He actually, great story, he hung up on Miles because he thought it was one of his friends pulling a joke on him, and then Miles calls back and says, this is Miles Davis, and he practically fainted and took the gig. Carl Allen started playing with Freddie Hubbard while he was still a student here. Bill Stewart started playing with John Schofield while still in the program. So the point is, how did that happen? They got their name out there. They started going to the right places and meeting the right people who all live here. Aside from the very vital performance uh, atmosphere here, research and the history of the music are very important parts of the program as well, not only to prepare our students for, as I said, doctoral programs, for being researchers, for uh, teaching, uh, in a, an academic environment, but also as a performer, as an arranger, to build a career in 2015, almost 16, it's very important to understand the context of your playing and of your writing. And in New York, you can get that context. This is a photo of what we call the Living Jazz Archives, which were uh, begun as a brainchild of the great sadly late Clark Terry, who worked with us for 10 years to build it. Those are Clark's horns in the glass case in the background, some of his awards. We also have the uh, archives of Thad Jones, James Williams, and now, as of about six months ago, the great saxophonist Michael Brecker. There are more on their way. This is a building thing. It's only about three or four years old. And we have grad seminars in this room. You can see the, the chairs and table. But we also have uh, over uh, 3,000 LPs, pencil manuscripts, pencil scores and parts, about 75 scores and parts of Thad Jones. 
we have all of Michael Brecker's music. We just got 650 cassettes of his that go all the way back. If you know his career, you're talking about uh, what the record industry would call bootleg live unreleased recordings with Elvin Jones, McCoy, Tyner, Herbie Hancock, Directions and Music, Chick Corea, Three Quartets, and informal things, rehearsal tapes, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a Grammy Foundation grant to digitize this. And of course, all of this material is accessible to you on a daily basis. Where This is so new that we don't yet have a website for this archive, but hopefully it's going to go up within the next six months we're working on this. Uh, the courses in research are there to give you a start as a scholar. You know? It's it's uh, uh, really a starting point for that scholarship, and the, that scholarship is linked directly into your performance and your writing. To talk about the tuition, first let's let's sort of talk about the tuition without the assistantship option. Even there, when you compare our tuition, and the full load is nine credits, so you're looking down at that nine credit option. This is per semester. You're talking about um, basically nine, less than $19,000 a year tuition. When you compare that tuition to some of our quote-unquote competition schools, some of the major conservatories, this is about a third of what that tuition is. Plus the fact that, of course, if you're going to school in New York City, you still haven't got a place to live in New York yet, and you're already out $55,000. So uh, the out-of-state tuition is, uh, as I said, about $19,000 per year. Uh, that's all tuition fee, the whole deal. In-state, if you are listening to this uh, on paper cups and string, <laughs> and you're closer to me and you're right in New Jersey, it's just over $12,000 a year. To study with this faculty at this level for $12,000 a year, there's no better bargain anywhere, I can assure you. So there's a lot of numbers here. You can see how the different fees line up. And uh, if you want, as I said earlier, to download all this, you can examine them uh, in more detail. The admissions procedures, the short of it is there are three stages. First, you fill out a university application. All this is online, so you can do this worldwide. University application, and you submit your recommendations. There's also a music department application, which will ask uh, various things of you that the rest of the school may not uh, care so much about, like what literature are you teach, uh, studying, who have you studied with, how did you hear us about us, etc. Then you upload audition tracks to uh, Slide Room. Uh, the auditions are all by upload. There are no finals. You do not have to travel to the campus. But just as a word of explanation, that doesn't mean that we don't want to meet you. Uh, it means that our tuition is so low in comparison to our uh, other competition schools that for a lot of people finances are a major issue here. And so what we were finding early on was that we would uh, proudly announce to somebody that they had made the finals and that they had to travel to the campus for an audition and they would get back to us and say, well, one of the reasons I'm applying there is because it's so inexpensive. We live in Sacramento, we live in Tucson, we live in, you know, Berlin you only accept one out of six or seven people. You're a purposely small program. We can't afford the trip there, so we're dropping out. So to even the table, it's all by upload. However, please consider this an open invitation to come here for a visit. Be, uh, you know, I will pronounce you officially a graduate student for the day, and you can just do what they do. You can bring your instrument. If you're a vocalist, just sit in on ensembles. You can sit in on rehearsals, attend classes, meet the faculty, meet the other grad students. Of course, we can meet. I can show you the facilities, and you can really get a feel for what it's like to go to school here. A lot of people say, I guess the quote was from one of our recent grad students who said, you know, I've never, in all the schools I've visited, I've never seen such a high level of talent and such a low level of attitude. 
and you know what he means by attitude. I don't mean that in a positive way. In other words, it's a very welcoming environment here. All the students play with each other. And by the way, the undergrad program is at such a high level here that a lot of the ensembles are mixed. I mean, when you have sophomores and juniors that play at this level, there's no reason to segregate them from you. So obviously your courses are all with grad students, and some of your ensembles may be as well, but some of your ensembles you'll be playing with uh, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors who may be teaching you and us a thing or two. So this is the, the short uh, version of the application uh, process. This is the long version. This is from our website, and as I said, this is a lot of data. You can get all this on the website or from the, the, the package that you can download, but um, Suffice to say, the audition, oh, check that out. It says the audition CD or tape. Wow, this has been around a while. Please, no tapes. Uh, we threw away our, the, the cassette player is over in the archive. That's the only one we own now. It's essentially three tunes, an up-tempo tune, a medium-tempo tune, and a ballad. And you will see here some suggested selections, but that's more for the undergrads because we got so many, uh, you know, guidance counselors and parents calling, asking, uh, questions that didn't need to be asked. For you, it's up to you. We'll leave it up to you uh, to choose your repertoire, and these are the three required minimum tracks of uh, standards, if you can, that are at these tempos. But if you're a composer, performer, it's a great idea to include one or two of your originals. If you play another instrument other than your major instrument, if your sax player plays flute and clarinet, you can include them on one of the tracks. If you're a pianist who plays organ, the bassist who plays upright and electric, yes, in that answer to that question, we do have electric bass players here. Uh, you can do that. Uh, for arrangers, this uh, is just the performance requirements. For arrangers, of course, we're asking you to uh, send a uh, you know set of scores as well with the audio. So you can upload those scores and uh, become part of the adjudication process through that as well. If you would like to uh, get still more information about the program, uh, we have a great YouTube video that we did three years ago when we did the 40 year anniversary called William Patterson Jazz, 40 Years Pioneering Jazz Education. And uh, it, there's a, this is one of those way too long YouTube links, but you can uh, either click on it later and download it, or you can just go to William Patterson Jazz and you can get interviews with Mulgrew Miller, with Rufus Reed. You can really get some uh, more photos and video and audio about the program. Also, we have uh, audio on the website that has some of our small groups, the big band lists of a uh, larger list of alumni, uh, uh, awards, etc. There's all sorts of things on the on the website that I welcome you to attend. And uh, finally, here is the uh, address of the website. Here is the address of our admissions office and the music admissions office, the grad admissions phone number and the music admissions number, my email, and our address if you want to put it in there and get in the car and come on over. Any day is really great to be here, except Friday, because so many of the faculty and students, this is a great, actually, evidence of the activities of the students, is that they're not here on Fridays because they have so many gigging commitments. So Monday through Thursday, please come for a visit. It would be great to meet you, and uh, hopefully I can meet you right now. If you have any questions about the program, I've been talking way more than you probably want to hear. And uh, I'd love to entertain any questions, uh, see if I have uh, uh, any areas that I have not covered or anything that pertains to you specifically. Um, for any of uh -huh. our attendees who have uh, a question that they'd like to ask, right there in the chat box, uh, you can type your question. Um, we'll be uh, answering them one by one as they come in. Uh, also, for anyone who may have joined us late, uh, you'll notice right under the handouts tab there on GoToWebinar, there is the PowerPoint presentation uh, that Dr. Dempsey just went through available for you to download. So for all of these links and email addresses and other information that you might want to be able to refer back to, that's uh, available for you to download now. Um, we did have uh, a question uh, come through. Uh, one student asked, can arrangers get involved uh, with the performance program? And I guess then uh, also is the opposite true as well. 
the answer for both is yes. Uh, I may have uh, not mentioned the, this statistic at the beginning of my presentation that the entire jazz program is a purposely small program. There are about 57 high 50s number of undergrads and then the graduate students we have never had on purpose, never had more than 20 grad students. Usually we bring in 8 to 10 a year. So because of that small size, it's very easy to customize these degrees. Uh, arrangers, even though their principal lesson is with one of the arranging faculty, it's very easy to set up a private instrument lesson or voice lesson as well. Uh, it's easy to add a second ensemble that is uh, uh, in addition to the one required. Uh, it's easy to take some of the performance courses. If you wanted to take as an arranger, take that performance practice course with Bill Charlap. Likewise for the performers, um, it's quite easy on a space available basis, of course, but it's quite easy to get uh, some work with one of the arranging faculty uh, so that you can get started and or continue your career as an arranger as well. So really, uh, you might almost call it a double major, or some of these options are double majors, but in, in, in our program, we just call it, you know, the unification of the two programs. That's uh, very available. Uh, all sorts of uh, customization options as well. And related to that, for example, if you do play a second instrument, if you're a saxophonist, we can set you up with flute lessons or clarinet lessons with, not with a grad student, but with uh, one of the resident faculty here. And we had another student. I know you'd spoken a lot about our uh, relative proximity to, to New York City. Um, could you elaborate a little bit further on how um, some of the students from your experience are getting into the city? Are they taking mass transit? Are they driving? How often are they utilizing the city? Um, how is it uh, incorporated in the program for you guys? Well, there is a New Jersey transit bus that uh, a bus route that goes past our library steps and in about 40 to 45 minutes ends up at the Port Authority Terminal uh, on the west side of Manhattan. So that's one way we get in there, but uh, normally when students are going into New York City, they're going there to either perform themselves or to hear performances. And if you're going in in the evening, it's really far better to just carpool it. Uh, and the reason is not getting in, the reason is getting out. Because any uh, mass transit in any city, once you get after midnight, the schedule starts to get very wide open. And you don't want to be sitting at the Village Vanguard or the Blue Note or Birdland. Everybody else is enjoying the music and you have beads of sweat on your forehead, you know, looking at your watch. So uh, most of the time our students carpool and they quickly learn where the on-the-street free parking is in New York. And uh, if really, as soon as you have more than one student in the car, it's the same cost as mass transit, even to pay the tolls and the gas. And if you have more students in the car, it's cheaper. So uh, to completely answer that question, our students are in New York constantly, as is our faculty. I mean, whenever I go into New York to uh, go hear a show at one of the clubs, I always see multiple students there. Our students are there practically every day. As I said, this is part of the New York jazz community, and if you're in another part of the country geographically, you know, we're in New Jersey, and of course, if we're talking about some states, Texas, California, that means a six-hour drive, but here we are literally within sight of Manhattan. Uh, we're, uh, you know, very close to the Hudson River and you go across via the George Washington Bridge of the Lincoln Tunnel and you're in Manhattan. So it's very easy to get there. And then we have another question. You had spoken about the uh, graduate assistantships. Um, could you talk a little bit about how a student who's interested in pursuing a graduate assistantship uh, might go through the application process to do so? Sure. The application process is done, it can be done at the same time you apply. And uh, you need two letters of uh, recommendation, your resume or CV, and an application. And those recommendation letters can be the same two that you use 
for your application for admission. So many of our students do that at the same time. Who doesn't want a full ride assistantship? So that happens, but you can also do it uh, later. Uh, the deadline for admissions, I didn't mention this, the deadline for all materials is February 1st for next fall, and the deadline for uh, uh, grad assistantship materials is April 1. And we usually try to notify sometime in April, and I know this is a tight window because some other schools notify by April 15th. So it's a tight window, but as I said, but uh, that's the process. And uh, just to further explain, these are grad assistantships, not teaching assistantships. Some of the people in the uh, music department who are grad assistants also do assist with some of the teaching, and some of the people who don't have assistantships also help with the teaching as grad students. Uh, as members of some of those ensembles, you're kind of a, a, a leader in waiting anyway. That's the way the ensemble format is set up. But uh, you know, when you come here, you don't want to study with a grad assistant. You yourself or one of the undergrads, you want to study with the resident faculty that I mentioned earlier. And all their names, by the way, are on the website. You can look up the bios and everything. So that uh, that's the way the assistantships work. And it's a really great deal, as I said. To, the tuition is low enough, but to, to study with these people and actually uh, at this level and actually get uh, not only a full tuition ride, but also a stipend that goes along with that, you can't beat that. Um, well, I believe that's it for questions for right now. Um, just so you know, we are going to be sticking around for a couple minutes. If you do have any additional questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, we'll make sure we uh, have the opportunity to answer them for you. Um, David, that was wonderful. Uh, can't thank you enough. Um, I hope that was informative for everybody that took the time to join us. Again, um, from everybody here at William Patterson, uh, from the music department, from the graduate admissions department, um, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your schedule this evening to join us. And certainly, uh, please don't be a stranger. If you have any questions, we'd love to see you on campus at the grad admissions office. I know uh, David and others within the music department would be happy to get the opportunity to meet you face to face and talk more about your interests and your experience. Uh, and again, um, we hope to hear from you soon. Everyone have a wonderful evening and thank you again.